Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Tanook Chat. We're going to sit here and chat about Ben Craft and his life. Uh, ben has come, grew up uh, in Everson at a time when Everson was the center of northeastern Washington County in a very thriving, uh, proper, uh, growing metropolis as a commercial center. And it uh, went into a decline after that. So Ben will be able to tell you, I guess maybe because Ben left, maybe. I don't know. But uh, anyhow, he was here when it was his highest uh, and most active period. And I'm going to have, have him start with his parents and grandparents to, to tell you how they all arrived at Everson. So without further, further ado, I introduce you to Ben Kraft. Well, thanks for everybody being here. I don't really know why I'm up here because it's supposed to be somebody who's old is doing this. And I'm really not that old, but I'll do it anyway. Um, the way my father got here was uh, he was living in Arlington for a little while, uh, running a uh, working in the timber industry, and he was cutting ties for the railroad. And it was called the Stanwood Tie Company. And he had a few uh, sawmills along the way, and he ended up <coughs> the owning timber uh, up in Paradise Valley, and he was logging that, so they moved into Nooksack. And my mother grew up in Stanwood. Uh, their <coughs> her mother and grandfather uh, had immigrated from Sweden uh, and had lived in Quincy, Washington for a while and finally they were able to get out of Quincy and move to Stanwood and they had a small dairy farm. And <clears throat> my father met my mother at a dance hall and <clears throat> the rest is history uh, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and so that's how <clears throat> my family got into uh, Nooksack and they had a sawmill in Nooksack uh, where Mendrick's molasses uh, is now <clears throat> that was a sawmill and then up on the corner of uh, South Pass and Sumas uh, Kendall on the uh, north west corner there was a they had another sawmill there uh, I'm not <clears throat> I think they had a portable sawmill up in the woods someplace but I'm not quite sure and <clears throat> they were they did pretty well they were doing really well but uh, there was a partnership and Timber was real cheap. They wanted to buy. Some people wanted to buy a bunch, and others thought that the price would never go up. And uh, eventually, the price spiked, and uh, there was the profit went out of it. And I remember my father coming home one day. I was about four years old, and he drove his dump truck home, and the roof was caved in, and his pants were all ripped up, and he almost got killed from a falling tree and he said that was it and uh, and so he went into the dairy farming business and went <coughs> and gave up his logging. Ben, could you by the way tell us, do you know the name of the uh, sawmill, the mills that they had, the two mills? No, I don't know the names of them. Uh, I mean, it, it, they were called the Stanwood Tie Company and okay. so I don't know if uh, it was Mill A and Mill B, or uh, <clears throat> but you know the, the payroll is Stanwood Tie Company. What about the two mills that were here? That's those were the those were it. The, okay. Those were it. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> Warner uh, up on the South Pass Road has some had some of Dad's sawmill equipment, a couple blades. Uh, that he had sold that kept on using for a while. Uh, but <clears throat> that was pretty much the end of the uh, lumber timber baron part of our family and we went into the farming part. And where the farm where was the farm? Oh okay my <clears throat> the original farm was right behind the Presbyterian church where the uh, development is now and it went into um, part of the golf course and it was a 32 acre farm or a 33 acre farm that uh, we ran. It, the most he ever milked I think 
was about 28 cows and in the summertime he'd dry up most of them to where there'd be five or six or eight cows <clears throat> so he had plenty of time to put up the hay and take care of the things that needed to be taken care of on the farm. It's a, a lot different <clears throat> way of farming today than back then it is a lot different period back then. Were you still milking thing. by hand? Or? No, we had surge milking machines. They were, uh, they'd hold five gallons of milk and it would run off of a compressor, off a vacuum. They'd hang on the belly and, of the cow. Right, you put a strap over the cow and, and hang the bucket on the strap. And, uh, and then you'd, <clears throat> the real advanced farmers had a pipeline that would just put the milk right into the tank but that was <clears throat> that was pretty uncommon yeah. and most everybody you know you'd carry you know you'd get a five gallon bucket and you'd take it into the milk tank and dump it in and get it cooled down as fast as you, you could. You were shipping in a tank then rather than the buckets and the cans. Right, right. Uh, <clears throat> well, I think probably the first year or maybe the first two years it was buckets but uh, dairy gold phased them out, and uh, I remember there was a big discussion about having to buy a 200-gallon milk tank, and where was the money going to come from? And uh, and, <clears throat> and cans worked just fine, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but what year about is this? Uh, that would have been. I was probably probably around 52, 53. In early fifties. Yeah, early fifties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, my house that I grew up in is where the car wash is now, <laughs> and right beside it was the old Carnation uh, Dairy Arden uh, Farms. Arden's Farms and Carnation, and uh, <clears throat> I can remember as a little guy, you know, I could <clears throat> crawl up on a bench and watch, look out the windows, and uh, it was really fun to watch these tank trucks come in with all the cans because they would go down these, you know, they'd be outside the building for a while and then they'd be inside the building and it was just a lot of fun watching all the milk cans going uh, along a conveyor belt. And, and uh, I just couldn't believe it that they were going to discontinue that because, I mean, what's a kid going to do, you know? <laughs> so, uh, and that's just a little side topic on, on, the, on the dairy. And, and eventually, you know, the dairy moved out, and then the county used it for a while, uh, the county road department. Uh, and then eventually they got their own digs in Strandell, and uh, then the Cow Milkers Association used it. Uh, it was a, the Hutink family was buying milk from the farmers and hauling it to some cheese place in Oregon and uh, after <clears throat> that went on for about eight years and then when that stopped uh, uh, the fire department was looking for a new building and so they burned it down and uh, put up a new a new fire hall. And so it was they burned it down? Yeah, you know actually I worked all night trying pulling timber out when they were burning it and uh, uh, because there was just beautiful lumber in it. Uh, it was, <clears throat> you know, you, you'd look 30 feet on a board and not find a knot on it. So, uh, and, uh, so I, I, did they salvage the lumber before they burned it? Then no, 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 no. no. That's how they made the fire was <laughs> with the lumber. So you were trying to uh, haul burning logs out well, of a burning you building. Well, it wasn't all burning at one time. You know, they were they were putting it pile by pile with their excavator and I was trying to get as much of it out as I could and, uh, and I did, you know, I, I went for the heavy beams and stuff like that. And, uh, <laughs> the reason I, I stopped you there is that sounds like me. Uh, the, you, you don't let good stuff burn up. <laughs> you know, you're going to salvage it some way, somehow. Maybe the city people or whoever has to own it doesn't think it's worth anything. But they, uh, they, they well, I remember, uh, uh, I can't remember his name now, but anyhow, he worked for a cannery for many years. And uh, my wonderful family, uh, the Kales, 
decided whenever the uh, cannery closed that uh, they would uh, burn their records. Now what a historian can stand to see records being burned? Well, one of the uh, employees was there, was noticed one uh, book was not on fire, so it got out of the fire and behind a bush, and uh, the rest of the stuff burned up. I have seen that uh, thing. It's the payroll records from 1940 to 1941, and there were almost 600 people employed during that time, and I have all their names and all their salaries. Uh, he did pro make me promise not to disclose any of the uh, salaries Aww. until after. Well, he's dead now, so you see he's, his hold is kind of gone now. But I thought of, that's exactly what I would do. I would, you can't burn that. And so you'd be hauling it out to someplace else. So thank you for that story. <laughs> uh, when did the fire department uh, build the new building in that spot? Uh, 70s. In the Early 70s, 70s sometime. Okay. You know, late 70s. So that farm lasted until the 70s then? Well, that house that I grew up in lasted until the 70s. Okay. But uh, the farm itself was uh, uh, sold in 65, 1965. Uh, So did you, when you salvaged this timber, did you use it for projects down the road then? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I think, you know, if I can look around some of the buildings that, you know, you can probably identify some of the stuff that uh, is still being used. But most of it's covered up with stuff, you know, mm -hmm. walls and other things. But yeah, it reminds me of a story. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been in the Linden Museum? You notice those beams that are in the Linden Museum that are across the, uh, that support the roof? Uh, I have been told by Troy that some of the people who go to the museum, you know, they have to walk up through the beams to get to the second floor. They have my more intrigued with the beams that, are, that the building is, that the roof is supported by than the actual museum itself because he said those are all hand hewn beams, hand manufactured. They came from the PAF cannery in uh, uh, Bellingham, which Dwayne Dunlap tore down, and the city said they wanted to keep the his trusses, the overhead trusses, so he stacked them all on one side. Eight or ten years later, he went by and they were all covered with blackberries, and he asked the county, what the uh, city, what they're going to do with the, with the overhead trusses, and they said, well, we'll probably let them rot. So he went in and got his truck and went in there and drove them all out here, and three of them went in, or three or four of them went into the Linden Museum building, a couple of them are in his uh, uh, museum down in Nooksack. You may not know that it was a museum that sits down behind the, uh, his old Dunny's drive-in. Uh, and uh, so he says, put them around, but he said he couldn't stand to see him just sit there and rot, even though he got paid to tear them down and stack them. He just uh, had to take them away. So there's still some of us, us guys around. <laughs> So what was your cow doing in the fire hall? Hmm? What was that? What was your cow doing in the fire hall? Well, he was showing that he could jump through a window. <laughs> uh, well, that's... Uh, that <laughs> Wait a minute. That was a good story. Well, it, well, yeah, well story. I, can, I can tell it. Uh, I, <laughs> I bought... We bought a uh, two steers at the auction, Everson auction, um, in our beginning stages of farming. And uh, you know, why steers? If you're going to start, well, you're gonna milk uh, well, we were raising them for beef. We were okay. See, I put up a bunch of hay, and being the smart businessman I am, you know, I thought, well, you know, I might as well, instead of selling the hay and letting somebody else make the money on it, you know, I'll just, I'll just feed it to my cows and. Uh, make a profit <laughs> and so you know i bought we bought two steers in the fall and this one you know he'd come off the herd you know off the plane someplace because i think the first time he ever saw a human being was in <laughs> the auction and <laughs> but you know, i got him <laughs> and i got an, another steer that was wasn't too wild but uh, caused me a lot of misery, uh, but <clears throat> I could have them hauled home for 50 bucks, and that was quite a bit of money, you know, because you know, I spent all my money on 
animals, but, uh, but I had a pickup truck and I had some side rails and, and I had a few two by fours laying around that I could put in the back, you know, to keep them from jumping out. And, you know, I had several offers from cattle haulers. Are you sure you want to do this? You know, we can, we can get them up to your place, <laughs> no problem. But, uh, you know, the pencil was pretty sharp and I could just see what I could save 50 bucks. And we got them in the truck and headed home and things were going pretty good. And then we had a discussion on whether we should stop or not to pick up some stuff at my brother's freezer for dinner. And I really didn't think it was a very good idea to stop. But I got overruled and we stopped. And as I stopped, you know, the truck went one side to the other side. And I, as I was looking in back, I saw these two by fours just going to toothpicks. I mean, they exploded. And then the cow, the steer, he got out. And, and so I started chasing him. I don't know what I'd ever done if I would have caught him. But I was chasing him. And I told Gretchen to keep the other one in the truck. And, and, and so uh, the first steer, he went around through everybody's yard on, on my block. And, and then he got into the, they were building the new fire hall, and he went in there. Now, fortunately, they hadn't put the glass in, but he was in that fire hall, and, you know, if a cow can put its head through a window or a, a building or an area, they kind of figure they can just get their whole body through it. And he did. And he didn't make, he didn't take any bricks out either, you know. And, you know, there was a couple of two-by-fours that were messed up, but so they he ran down Van Buren and by that time there was some trucks following him and some kids on the bicycle and and he cut off to the golf course and and so then you know he was headed right to a green he hit that green grass and his feet were just flying up and down you know and I just thought oh god not not you know don't go on the green. And, and there was a golfer that came running with his club and it scared him enough so he went around the green and, and he headed for the cornfield on the far end. That kind of, uh, on, yeah, be on the northeast corner all the way across. And there was nothing I could do about that. So I went back to get to see if the other cow or steer was in the truck. And as I got in towards the truck, I saw it jump out. <laughs> and the whole thing repeated the whole thing. I mean, everything, except that we had, instead of having three or four pickup trucks and 10 bicycles, we had probably 17 trucks and <laughs> half the town, and it went down the main street. <laughs> and then <clears throat> turned over by High Notes and went down the sidewalk and then down the Van Buren, across the golf course. And, <clears throat> and I never, I couldn't find him. And uh, I couldn't find the other one. And I finally found, you know, we located both of them, and I couldn't get within 200 feet of the steer. And, I mean, he was happy in the cornfield, but uh, the farmer wasn't so happy about it, I'm sure. And uh, so, you know, I ended up having to spend, I think, 75 bucks to get the bed out and they gave him a tranquilizer. Oh, wow. <laughs> to get him into the truck. And because it was the only, you know, <laughs> I wasn't going to be able to throw a lasso 200 feet, but if I <laughs> would have, I mean, so we got him home where it was, uh, and I had to stay up with him all night because the vet said, you know, you can't let that head lay down hmm. or he'll die. So I was up with him all night, and I put a, I didn't have a harness, but I put a collar around him, and I put a rope on the collar so he wouldn't get away. And you know, the collar was pretty tight fitting, but it would do the job for that night. And 
about eight o'clock in the morning he woke up and he looked at me and then he went back to sleep you know, <laughs> for about ten more minutes and then he got looked at me he jumped up and with one swing of his neck he snapped the rope in half <laughs> and, I, and I thought oh, oh no because <laughs> yeah. my fencing wasn't really that good a fence <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> he stayed in the field and uh, you know I kind of knew where he was at and he was eating grass so it was okay but I still didn't know where the other one was and, and so I went from house to house to house over by the, uh, it would be the uh, old Advent uh, church camps. And, and finally I found the man who said, oh yeah, we, I, I've got a nice looking animal came in last night. And, and he, was eating, uh, he was eating some hay and had him nice and calmed down. Were kind of calmed down, so uh, we, <clears throat> I got a, a chain and we led him home. Okay? <laughs> and, but the long story short, I, <laughs> I fed him probably f four tons of hay that winter, and <clears throat> I had initially laid out, I think it was $600 for both of them, and we <laughs> sold them in the spring, and I got. <laughs> Five hundred bucks. <laughs> so, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be much of a cat. <laughs> the house I grew up in, where it was at the car wash, I tore it down also, and half of it was a, a cedar log house. It was built by the Seelan family uh, back in. I think 1886. Um, it was a really a nicely built cedar house, and it had rails for your rafters, and it had planks, uh, you know, any, you know, for your floor, and uh, and the logs themselves were <coughs> six inches wide, and some of them were 20. Wow, well, one was 32 inches thick, and the other ones it was generally around 24 <laughs> inches. Uh, deep and uh, <clears throat> and I found in the cracks where the logs were you know they had stuffed newspapers in them to, to keep the wind out and uh, there was the Bellingham Reveille and it was uh, <clears throat> 1886 to 1888 so <laughs> and it was built in that time frame and then the second half of it was had been added on Probably in the early teens, it, there, you could still find quite a few square nails in it. Um, but uh, it was a thing that was impressed. Oh, as I was tearing down, taking off the roof, you know, it had battens, one, you know, every one by sixes, and there'd be a space about like so, and then there'd be another to cover your roof. And I was pulling those out down at the very bottom, there was a, a flask of, uh, an empty flask of, <laughs> of, it looked like probably whiskey, that the roofer, <laughs> you probably lost it up on the top of the roof, <laughs> slid all the way down. But I guess uh, back then they still had it sneak a drink once in a while. <laughs> probably was cold when he was doing it, huh? Well, it might have been Anywhere cold, now. but. Uh, uh, and I, there was no fatalities in that house, so he got down the roof okay. <laughs> it was, that was a two-story house. That was a two-story house. Was the cabin, was the log house also two-story? Right, yep. Huh? And they had, uh, again, they had cedar <laughs> rails for the uh, ceiling of the, or the floor of the second, mm. second floor. When did okay. they add the house to the log cabin? Uh, my, my guess is, is probably in the early teens, okay. and then there was a, another piece added on later, it was probably in the 40s. How long were those logs? Um, I th it seems like they were about 30 feet long. So you're talking about putting a two foot, a two foot thick log, 30 feet long, 20 feet in the air. 
Well, actually, the, the walls themselves went up to about 10 feet. 10 feet. And then we had... Uh, oh, it shows the gable. The right. second floor was half, mm -hmm. half story. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but all the thick ones were on the bottom, and most of the... They went down as they went right. up. Right. Were they uh, uh, edged? How did they? Were they flattened at all? They were all flattened with an A's. A's. Were they square or? They, they were square and uh, rectangular, and the, <coughs> the the notches that were put together on the corners, you couldn't really put a razor blade in. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, and I was always puzzled. I mean, they, they just fit so perfectly, but I couldn't understand why they hadn't spent a little bit more time. If they could make it that perfect on the on the corners, maybe they should have spent a little bit more time so they wouldn't have gaps uh, on, the side. on the sides. Yeah. But I guess the newspaper was cheap. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, George Goodwin was doing a lot of broad axe work uh, at that time, and a lot of the old buildings were built by George Goodwin, and he was he squared them up like the one on the, up by the uh, on the mass here in the good one? Okay. Um, there's uh, Cy Lockenbach, mm -hmm. uh, and is it Cy? No, Ralph, on, right. on the ceiling road. His house is a, a log house. Oh, it is. And, and it's built by the ceiling, uh, the same as ours was. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think he probably built a few more, but I don't know any more. So, how did you get them down? Well, that was easy. They're light, and, and you just start from the top and... Just knock them off. Huh? Well, yeah, you just lift them off, and uh, that was... Gravity took care of the rest. Absolutely. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> and they didn't break? Oh, no. no. <laughs> and none of them were rotting? Uh, there was a couple that were a little bit rotted, and... They were probably uh, on the bottom, huh? Um, it was on the southwest corner. Uh, it was. We always had a prevailing uh, wind. We, yeah, we always had a leak, in, you know, with the with the south oh, wind. Oh, you did. And that was the cause. I mean, I don't know what caused the leak, but you could see what, what the you leak. You see where the damage was. Yeah. yeah. But well, you tore that down in when? See. That would have been in um, probably '73. Mm -hmm. So it was about 80 years old. No, it was about uh, 90 years old. Then. Yeah. It was '79. Yeah. Well, was it 79. Yeah, 79. Okay. That's almost 100 years old then. Yeah. Be 77, 74 years old. So. And who knows? And, and you still have some of those logs? Well, some of them, yeah. I mean, I put them all to use. Um, and, oh, except for a few of them. Is that? Oh. Is it on? It's, no, it's not working. It's on. No, it is not. No, it's not. There it is. There we go. <laughs> now they'll be able to hear you. I was just told once that there was a, a gold mine and a stagecoach that went right up that way. Uh, Sealand? Uh-huh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah there's, actually, I found there's, there's two known. I'm going to hold it up a little further. I found one time I found five different mines all the way up that uh, trail. But Back in early 90s, we had some real heavy f rain and floods, and a lot of that creek just filled up with debris and washed out the trail, and you can't bushwhack anymore. Oh. And I mean, I guess you can, but it's going to stop me. But <clears throat> there was a couple of them that had, had rails in them, but it was it, uh, for, you know, ore cars. But I, th I don't think there was any ever any gold that was taken out of it, you know, then <clears throat> there was a good investment scheme and a couple people made quite a bit of money or one person made a fair amount of money and they never caught up to him and he left <laughs> town uh -oh. is how I understand it and uh, there's still a community, you know, a ghost, you know, foundations and an old safe and some water systems uh, you can be found up on that trail. Yeah, I, I hiked up there once, and uh, <clears throat> it looked like it was uh, an open door to some mystery and all this kind of stuff, but it, it just faded away, I guess. I've lived here 32 years now, so most of that has disappeared. 
Yeah, it's kind of sunk into the ground, but there's mm -hmm. still a, uh, a fair amount of steel up there. Um, Very but, interesting. Stuff. Oh yeah, we spent uh, I spent a lot of time as kids playing up there. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was a great place to play. And did you did you go in the cabin that was? Oh, there? of course, and one in the mines too. The, the things I mean, on the wall. Anything we could me. get into, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad you aren't here. <clears throat> you weren't there <clears throat> to um, what was I saying? <laughs> you were yeah. asking about the mine. Oh yeah. About two minutes. Well, no. the um, writings on the wall. There are all kinds of uh, like stories on the cabin, uh -huh. inside the cabin, inside the cabin on the wall. And I never saw. I didn't see any. I might have seen some initials carved in the walls. Yeah, maybe some graffiti. <laughs> yeah. Well, was it ever lined with newspaper? I mean, was it actually a cabin living in, or was it always a... Like it's a old homesteader's cabin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I don't know how long they lived in it. It was a pretty deep area. Yeah. Well, Must have been tough to farm, though. Newspaper. It would seem like, but uh, <laughs> just what every place is. But look at the Westergreens. They've been there for yeah since uh, 83, so they've been there a long time, and that's pretty tough. Farming up there too. Yeah, all slanted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Used to be a gold cart. You know, an ore oh. cart. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, in the. In, in, in the, the mine. In not the in the mine, but it was outside. Uh -huh. You know, part near, next to the trail, and the safe. Mm -hmm. And then there used to be the stone foundations right. of the buildings. But I only found three holes. You found five. Yeah, you had to keep on going. <laughs> yeah, you had to keep going. That's right. We're still looking for pictures of the old uh, buildings. If somebody knows where some are, my mom remembers the dance hall that, that was used to be up there, but uh, and uh, some of the other buildings. And I've got a story written by the uh, guy who opened the mine uh, that talks about the various buildings that were up there, which they kept open and operating for a number of years after the mine closed. So oh my gosh. It was an entertainment center. Well, <coughs> the river was a real entertainment center for us kids too. Uh, you know, if we didn't, if we weren't up on the, uh, uh, playing up in the mine area, and I mean that was quite a pebble to get up there. And so you, you either had to have good fortune and hitch a ride with some parent who's going to take their kids up. Uh, which usually never happened, or you had to bicycle. And so we spent most of our time along the river and along the Nooksack, you know, uh, having bicycle races along the... There was always a... a <clears throat> where the dike is now, there was a, a road, an access road for people to go fishing and... Uh, 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 or walking, or just in general, it was for public use. and. And us kids, we would in the summer, you know, we would always be racing along. You could make up dust, you know, and made you feel powerful to leave a dust cloud behind. <laughs> and then we'd go into the river and, and you know do some fishing, and we'd put set up a camp and and try camping out there. But usually, you know, you'd get driven out by mosquitoes, and you just oh wow, <laughs> they won on several occasions, but it was. Still, we spent a lot of time on the river, and, and, and nobody drowned. Uh, not any of my friends, although I almost did. I mean, it was you know you see death flash by you, and uh, I was just lucky, and I never did the same thing again. And uh, what did you do? <laughs> well, I was floating down the river in a truck inner tube from Nugent's Corner, and <clears throat> the river splits. And the current was trying to pull myself down, and I knew that uh, I had to let go because I was never going to pull myself up. And uh, I got washed down, oh, 150 yards, and got caught on a log, and uh, got all scratched up. And when I was able to finally get into shallow water, I, I, it was awfully hard to keep the knees from shaking. And I mean, I was one lucky fella. That, uh, and it was, it was, I felt it was really bad because I watched all my other friends go by as I was yelling for help, <laughs> and no one could do anything. And they finally landed, you know, a quarter mile downstream, and, and 
it was a good lesson that I survived in. So, but. Well, I'll bet you you went back again. N n not in an inner tube, I didn't. Oh, oh, <laughs> no. I have my canoe. But, uh, so were you just wearing trunks when that happened? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, but then good... you didn't have any shirt or anything, or you might have gotten snagged. Yeah, the yeah. snagging does well, a lot my of people foot was catching your clothes. Caught. Um, and, and it was all, you know, and I jerked on it, and it was able to, and I mean, I was, wasn't above water, I was under water. Yeah. And, you know, about every time I was out of water air, you know, I'd pop up for a minute, and poof, back down under. It was uh, scary. It's scary. Well, so, how old were you? Oh, uh, well, you know, I must have been about 14 or 15. Mm -hmm. I wasn't old enough to drive yet, but I think some of my friends were old enough to drive because mm -hmm. somehow we were able to get up to Nugent's Corner with mm -hmm. our inner tubes. Right. And, you know, we were just going to yeah. float down to it. And we'd done it before. Yeah. Uh, and it probably would have been better if I had a paddle instead of using your hands for a paddle. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's even better not to do it. You <laughs> <laughs> say, take one look and go the other way. We, we, also, you know, <coughs> You know, when we were kids, we would walk down to the, walk through Everson uh, with our 22s and, and, and shoot cans all day long in, at the, at, along the river, you know. And I mean, there was always cans, beer cans down there. We stayed away from the beer bottles because we knew that that would make a lot of mess. But, you know, everybody would go down there and drink in the, <coughs> in the evenings and, whether it's fishermen or kids that aren't supposed to be drinking or what, but I mean, there was n a never-ending supply of beer cans, and and you know you could buy you know buy a thousand twenty-two shells for I think four ninety-five from uh, Sears and Rosebuck through the mail. And, and but I was thinking about that and how much fun we had, and I mean we were nobody got shot, and we were careful, but if. Somebody walked down the street with a 22 today, you know, the SWAT team would be out and you'd have drones and, and you know, somebody could get killed, you know. Just being so and, and that's how much, it, in my time, I've seen it change to where, uh, um, you know, kids can be kids and not really get into a whole lot of trouble. And it's a lot easier to get into trouble now and I mean there's a lot of crazy people out there now too but uh, and uh, you know I delivered newspapers for my entire childhood I started delivering when I was 10 and uh, by the time I upgraded when I was 14 I had made enough money to buy a motorbike and and so I was mechanized and uh, delivered papers until I was almost 17 and I finally got rid of it when I was a junior in high school. But, you know, whenever there was a state patrolman that went by or a sheriff, they looked the other way. And I mean, they knew, I mean, I, I was kind of a late bloomer, so at 14 I was probably looking like I was 10 or 11, but they, they'd still let me run my, my enterprise. And today, you, again, you can't really do that and <coughs> they can get in trouble and get sued because they didn't. Are they still showing movies in the opera house when you were a kid? Um, yeah, right up until I was six years old I think or five years old or maybe four years old. I remember going to a movie, uh, the, the good, good ones I think had that, Goodrich ran the theater at the very end. Uh, and that's, that was where the parking lot is for Casey's uh, Bar and Grill and where that yeah. Expresso place is. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had hoped for years that they would rejuvenate it and have movies again. And every once in a while the doors would be open and I thought for sure they were getting ready to have movies again, but it, it never happened. But also... <coughs> During the movie times, there was uh, three grocery stores, a dress shop, or two dress shops, a five and ten cent store, um, uh, one, two, you know, several mechanic shops, uh, uh, a car dealership, 
uh, made his mortar with they sold Chrysler, Chrysler, yeah, Chrysler, Dodge, and Plymouth. And uh, Did it, was, have a it was a furniture store. Oh yeah, it was a Heinz? furniture store, Heinz Furniture. It was, it was the big Kahuna in the whole county. And drive a little, save a lot. Drive a little, save a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and spend a lot while you're at it. <laughs> you went to Hilda's shop right, didn't you? Oh, Hilda's shop right. Yeah, or it, Hilda's shop right started off at uh, where the equipment store mm -hmm. is. And that was uh, Hilda's shop right on one part and the post office on the other part. And then Hilda expanded when Mady's went out of business. Uh, they moved into where uh, the business center is now with uh, Anthony. Uh, the Mady's building. Yeah, the Mady's building. And that was where Hilda's shop right was for uh, a long time. And then where the Silver Fox or whatever that closed Pat's up. Place or Pat's Place or Pat's Place. That was a five and ten cent store. And uh, and they'd sell bottles and uh, electric trains and baseball cards, a lot of baseball cards. You know. I like the chewing gum actually. <laughs> and then across the street there was a, Kate Sear had a dress shop, another dress shop, and then there was a barber shop there and a shoe repair. And then um, uh, we had the Everson Tavern, uh, where it's a floral shop now. And then mm -hmm. where the parking lot is, there was uh, Paulson's Foods mm -hmm. that uh, sold, you know, it was a grocery store. And it was, uh, it was <coughs> a pretty good store. Uh, and they were, were running competition with the Surview grocery store, which was at where the Napa Auto Parts is. And uh, that was a grocery store. And <clears throat> when their compressor caught on fire and burned out the grocery store, then they, um, that's when the hall of the Everson Shopping Center started, kind of. I mean, uh, Dick Powell owned the uh, Surview grocery store and, and had fire damage, and so they had to. <clears throat> build another grocery store, and uh, and so I converted into an auto parts store. Penny, what are your memories of like the Kale slash Everson Cannery? Oh, hey, those were <clears throat> the Everson Cannery. <clears throat> it was you know it was a, just a great economic engine for the community, and as a kid, it was a great place to play. You know, we'd sneak in on the weekends with our bicycles because you always find a way to get in. And we'd ride our bicycles all through the cannery. And, and you know, we were careful not to leave any skid marks, you know, <laughs> so we wouldn't get caught. But, uh, and I started working at the cannery when I was 16. And I worked there off and on until uh, I was 22 or 23. And it was, you know, they employed probably close to 150 people seasonal, and it was good paying jobs, and, uh, and it supported a lot of farms and uh, for buying their vegetables, the peas, beets, and carrots. Uh, and it's a real shame that it's not in operation now, but... Uh, uh, I was a, we had some really talented people in that cannery, you know, it could fix almost anything. And, and most of the steel was all pretty rusted up and we, you put a bead on it and <laughs> the only thing it had was a bead, no metal. But, uh, uh, it would run, I can remember the last year I worked there, I think I went 48 days without a day off. What did you do? Well, I ran uh, and, and took care of the machines that put the lids on the cans. Called seamers. The, the seamers, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ran them and then I'd repair them. And uh, I, was, I was kind of learning the trade. Frank Henderson, who was the superintendent at the time, uh, and he's also the person who got me into farming. Uh, and he was kind of like a second dad to me in a lot of ways. And, uh, he was. He taught me the seamer business, thinking that maybe, you know, it was a good profession to have, and 
and I could get a, on with American Can Company, which was a, a better paying job. But, uh, but that didn't work out. And I, uh, he told me that I could make $10,000 on an acre of raspberries. And uh, that was back in early 70, 72. And I mean, that's a lot of money. You could buy a new car for about $4,000. Yeah. So I wasn't all that greedy. So I figured two and a half acres would do me just fine. And, you know, <laughs> it was just perfect. You know, I worked three weeks out of the year and <laughs> just play the rest of the time. <laughs> Did it work out? What an idealist. Well, <laughs> well, eventually we did make 10000 on an acre, but, uh, uh, but no. <laughs> but not well, I understand it costs 10000 an acre to plant them now. It does, yeah. It's, it's really an expensive business. So. <laughs> well, Kelly, you got your first acre in. Yeah. Coles, Coles from Frank. Yeah, <clears throat> my first acre of raspberries, uh, Frank niece, niece who lived uh, just down uh, Emerson Road. on the Emerson Road. Mm -hmm. He had but across from Hukamas. He was a he grew raspberries and he was a trapper. And we, I he got he he let me go in and dig up a bunch of his plants to plant. Mm. And uh, he was a he's a great old guy and taught me a lot of stuff. And uh, he teach you how to trap. No, I, I wasn't interested in that. But he would have if I wanted to. Um, so we, Gretchen and I, we went and dug up the plants and planted them. And then uh, Jim Bailey uh, would take me down to the river. And Jim Bailey was Bailey's Tires. And I worked for him as a kid in his uh, tire shop. And <clears throat> he was kind of another dad to me, too. Uh, you know, just, <clears throat> and it's so true. There was a book titled called It Takes a Village to Make a Child. And I mean, for me, that was kind of the way it was. You know, there was a lot of people who had been great mentors and helpers in my life. And, and Jim Bailey was another one. And he took me to uh, down to the river where we cut railroad uh, uh, cedar poles, uh, fence poles or berry poles for the berry patch. And at that time, there was a overabundance of uh, cedar down there and it was legal to do and uh, and you know we just take out truckloads of poles and set them up for the berry field uh, now <clears throat> i'll wander back to the river you look at the river now and you don't see any old growth lumber you don't see any old growth trees you see cottonwoods but no firs or anything else so the ecology of the river has changed dramatically in the last 50 or 60 years. The, the log jams, I mean, they build log jams now for the fish instead of having natural log jams before. And there's just is no old logs in the river anymore. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> so Jim and I planted the uh, uh, berry poles, or got them and we've got them planted. And, Boy, you know, sure is a lot of work to take care of these raspberries, and we were doing them organically, so it was no, uh, no, no chemicals, and and we hauled seaweed from Chuckanut Bay to the farm for fertilizer, and we got, you know, it was actually it was a lot of fun to do, you know, hang out at Chuckanut and enjoy the water and, and get a pickup load of seaweed, and, and I mean life was good, you know. And, and we got it, we got the whole field covered with seaweed, and my neighbor's cows, they had 110 Charlet beef cows, big cows, and. They went through the fence and they ate all the seaweed <laughs> and they trampled on everything and uh, it was an absolute disaster and, and I thought, Phew, okay, this is done with and I'm done with it, you know, I, and this is just way too much work and way too many problems to deal with. So I went to, but I went and talked to the neighbors about the 
his cows and what they had done. And he, it didn't go real well. He, he said that I should have built a good fence. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute. I wasn't worried about my raspberries getting into your pasture. <laughs> <laughs> your cows went from your pasture into my raspberries, and there's something that ought to be done. And then it, from there, it kind of got ugly. <laughs> he said, I had no business farming. <laughs> and, and I said, I had every right to be farming if I wanted to. And, uh, but he angered me so much, and he was so disrespectful <clears throat> to me and my family that I, <laughs> it gave me resolve that I was going to keep farming and I would never stop and I would show him <laughs> that you know he was completely wrong and uh, he's I mean later on we kind of mended fences especially after he built a new fence <laughs> and, and we, I mean we did have our conflicts over the years but he was a good person and uh, uh, <clears throat> but you know, we, that was the tipping point for me and, you know, you can get uh, discouraged, but if if you hit the right button, you know, it gives you a lot of resolve. And that was uh, the resolve I needed to keep farming. So how did your uh, resolve turn into? What has it turned into? Well, it's turned into <clears throat> winter trips to the Baja. <laughs> but, 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 uh, you know, Gretchen and I... Uh, turned a dream into a reality mm -hmm. uh, and you know we were laughed at in the beginning on organic farming and uh, uh, and it was you know nobody most people didn't even know what it was you know so right. I said well it's, it's without using pesticides and yes and you can get the worm it's an organic worm so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, and it's it was for me it was I wanted it, I was looking for something different than what I had been exposed to in my life. I had come out of Vietnam and I realized that uh, what I believed in was all upside down and I questioned everything and I thought that there was, <clears throat> I wanted to do something positive with my life because we only have one shot at it and I wanted to make a difference and I felt like uh, <clears throat> this was a way for me to make a difference, I believed in what they were talking about in the Rodell Press, the organic gardening magazine. That was my, you know, thing I would read about all the time, and uh, um, and I wanted, I believed in small farms, and I had, uh, I just had a mission that I wanted to show that other people could do. We there was a place for small farms and good organic produce and uh, it took a lifetime to do it but we achieved it in uh, organic <coughs> we were just one of the pioneers and uh, but organic is now mainstream in all your stores and uh, uh, it's it's been really <coughs> neat to see it happen and <coughs> it was really tough at times you know, you couldn't uh, get the price that you deserved, and it cost you more to produce than a conventional farmer. But uh, things changed in the early 90s, and uh, <clears throat> it's been getting relatively better and better, although it's mostly all corporate now, rather than small farms are again uh, <clears throat> a novelty rather than a necessity. And uh, although I think they are a necessity, they, <clears throat> they're really a, a great engine, economic engine for a community because they have to buy a lot of small equipment, and they employ a lot of people, they pay their taxes, uh, and they're good <clears throat> stewards of the community and the property and the land and the habitat. So uh, not that conventional farmers aren't either. I mean, they have a great role to do, and they're doing a tremendous job and I always feel uh, <clears throat> combative when the dairy industry comes under attack. Uh, I feel like we have the greatest 
dairy farmers in the country, in the world, yeah. and, and, and they're really truly stewards of the land. Uh, there's <clears throat> a few bad actors in every business or in every industry, and I'm sure that there might be a bad actor in the farming industry, but in general, uh, they're caretakers and stewards of the earth, and it keeps us filled up with food. And in reality, you don't need doctors if you don't have farmers. That's true. <laughs> and what kind of crops do you grow for now? Well, we have grown, you know, a lot of different crops, but we did, and never made any money on strawberries. And the last time I took out the strawberry field, I was a whistling and a singing because I knew I was never going to touch them again. But we did uh, we did raspberries and blueberries. We were able to extend our raspberry season from uh, late May to sometimes into early December. Uh, and the reason why we did that because we learned that we could make a bunch of money, you know, extra money. Instead of having a four-week season, uh, you can, if you can extend it, it gives you a lot better cash flow. And so, different varieties? Uh, different varieties and different growing methods. And then we, uh, we did a lot of tomatoes. We built a greenhouse uh, to grow tulips in. And it was a total disaster the first year where I lost every... I mean, they grew wonderfully, but I didn't have a flower to sell unless you wanted to sell green leaves. And so we planted it in with tomatoes, and gee whiz, we've been growing tomatoes ever since. It paid for the greenhouse, the lost crop of tomatoes, and gave us a six-week vacation. So, uh, and we have mainly, you know, we have raspberries, blueberries, and strawberries as our anchor tenants, and then we have the kale family, you know, broccoli, uh, not so much cauliflower because you're dealing with a white surface, and if it gets bruised, people don't want to buy it. But <coughs> broccoli, you can bang it around, and uh, <coughs> it's easier to sell. Uh, <coughs> potatoes, basil, Gretchen has made a great salad mix. Uh, and I, everything that you can be growing, I think we've grown at one time or another. I'm growing some lemon Myers right now in the mm -hmm. greenhouse. Uh, so if anybody wants a lemonade franchise, <laughs> I've got them for sale. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and what? And what's Lemon the name of your farm? Home Hill Gardens. Continuing on, uh, we came to a realization that we're not putting dates on these things. So we're going to go back and try and put some dates on what we've been saying so that uh, you'll have a time frame. Uh, this young man here was born in the late 40s, so that uh, it's not early, early Everson, but it is uh, Everson in its heyday. And uh, he did tell you some of the dates about uh, in, in 52, he was when he noticed that he still saw a movie in the uh, theater, and uh, I'll let him tell you the rest. Well, <clears throat> I have a couple of stories uh, of what I did as a, as a kid for, you know, I you mentioned that we spent a lot of time along the river. Uh, well, this wasn't really on the river. Well, it was next to the river or over the river. Uh, uh, on the first story is that uh, actually a, a friend who's here today with me was in on this one, and that was we. There was a railroad bridge, and it had. Remember what year that was? Uh, this was in 1960. Uh, and back then we had a railroad bridge and a railroad, and we were, <coughs> I had some M80 firecrackers, <laughs> and, and I had a tin can, a, a Folgers tin can, and it was a pretty peaceful afternoon <laughs> for, a <while. laughs> for a while, but uh, anyway, we decided to climb up on top of the railroad bridge, and and we got up on top, and you know, you're probably 50 feet over the water, you know, uh, you know, quite a ways. And we <coughs> put an M80 on top of the trestle and a two pound Folgers coffee can on top of it uh, to see how far it would go in the air. And <coughs> I'm telling you, 
that made the Linden Tribune the next week. <laughs> I mean, truly. And it was unidentified explosion in the Everson Nutsack area. <laughs> and I mean, when, when that M80 went off, and I mean, I'm not sure if that can, it could still be in orbit. Because I never saw it come down, but the explosion over the water was just deafening. And I mean, and, and when I, you know, when anybody asked me about, did you hear anything? Oh, no, I didn't hear a thing, you know. And, but my friend and I went to his mother's place, his parents' place, and the first thing she said was, Benny, what were you and Gary doing today? <laughs> <laughs> and, and she knew exactly what had happened. And we, <clears throat> but anyway, I didn't get in trouble on that one. And the next story <laughs> I have on the bridge is that as a paper boy, you know, oftentimes I, if I had a, you know, sometimes I had friends that would help me or ride with me on the paper route, and we would, uh, you know, we weren't, we weren't bad kids, but we were mischievous, and we would, we would go underneath the bridge, and we usually found some cigarettes, so we'd be smoking cigarettes and practice cussing, and, <laughs> and just, you know, just being, just being kids, and, and this was in October of 19. 61, and uh, we decided it was kind of cold, so we better build a fire. And I think we had a whole pack of cigarettes you know, between three of us or four of us, and you know, we had three or four of uh, our mouths at one time. And, and, and then we built the fire to get warmed up. And the, when we finished the cigarettes, you know, we put out the fire to go deliver the rest of the newspapers in Strandell. And so <clears throat> we did that. It was, took about probably 35, 45 minutes to, on a good day to get the papers delivered in, in that area. And I was coming back up on the bridge and the first thing I saw was flames above the catwalk <laughs> of the bridge. And I mean, <clears throat> It was, you know, <laughs> whoa, talk about wobbly legs. And when I saw that, I knew this was not good. <laughs> and, and so we raced to the other end of the bridge, and we ran down, and our fire that we had put out had reignited, and it got the whole pile of driftwood on fire. Mm -hmm. And here is creosote dripping off the bridge onto the fire, and the flames were licking at those creosoted beans, and that, oh no, this can't be happening, you know, why me? <laughs> and, and you know, you look and you have all this water, but there was not a can or a bottle to transport the water oh, to your And cans. suddenly yeah. your coffee can came down. <laughs> <and> <laughs> I, thought I actually ended up finding a Coke can, but you know, I mean, that is not <laughs> you know, so we, you know, I think the adrenaline kicked in, and within minutes you could see these big logs smoking and burning, floating down the river. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really pretty amazing. It was one log after another after another, and and finally we got almost all the logs floating in the river and we were able to put out the uh, fire but I mean I was within five minutes at the max of seeing that whole bridge on fire and and unfortunately some kids were able to do what I almost did to the railroad bridge uh, and they caught it on fire and it was almost impossible to put the uh, fire out uh, <clears throat> once the creosote, creosote starts burning on the treated beans, and that was the, probably the final fate of the Milwaukee Road uh, of ever going running again through our town was because the railroad bridge was too badly damaged. Remember what year that was? Um, do I? That was probably uh, 1964. No, no 1968. No. 
68, yeah. I think 68. So those are my two when things. When did you start your farm? Or when did the, let's go back, when did the steers uh, escape from your uh, <laughs> Uh, vehicle. The, that would have been 1974. Ah. Yeah. So after you've learned these experiences, you went on to have more experiences. Uh, oh yes, and I've been having experiences my whole life. And the Charlets, <laughs> when did they get into your... Uh, that was in 1974. Well, that would have been 1973. I know you had busy years then. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Still are. Um, so, <clears throat> those are... I'm kind of storied out now. <laughs> so what what kind of a, you know, you said you had a paper out for what, four, six years, something like well, that? <clears throat> From 14 to 17? No, I, my, three years? my brother originally got the paper out from the Mabies family. Mm -hmm. And he did it for a year. And then I started, <clears throat> and he could take it when he was 12, so that put me down at seven or eight. And uh, I started being the substitute at nine. And and actually, that substitute was a full-time job. Because <laughs> my brother was either playing sports, or then he would uh, help dad on the dairy farm in the evenings. And at that time, the Bellingham Herald was an evening newspaper. Right. So basically, I was a paper boy from nine till about almost seventeen. And what kind of money did you see from that? I I. <laughs> Not much, I know. That's why you don't see paper boys today, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a tough, tough business. <laughs> I mean, bank. first you had to get paid. Yeah, and you you'd think 50 cents would be something that everybody could pay the paper boy. And, yeah, yeah. and you know, I got burned, yeah. you know, several times a year. And, uh, and I was a nice guy. You know, I'd always extend them a year, a month's credit. And... And sometimes, you know, even three months credit, because then what are you going to do? They promise you're going to pay. If I cut them off, I'm not going to get paid. <laughs> if I keep delivering them, you know, I may or may not get paid. But I think I was making about 40 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. and uh, But I spent it all at the fountain. There, right. there, was, a, there was an Everson drugstore fountain uh, uh, you know, they sold the drugs in one spot, and then they had a nice fountain where you could get a, a root beer float or that a was green in the old, river. That was in the, the old bank, bank building. So that, was, the, that was where the Jack Steakhouse, uh, Jack Steakhouse is now. And, well, actually, just part of Jack Steakhouse. Right. There was a bakery on the very corner of that steakhouse. But, but yeah, the newspapers was not a good business. And, but it kept me in candy, yep. and it, uh, uh, it, it didn't really keep me too much in clothes, but uh, uh, but I always was able to have a nice bicycle. And but in the summer times, we always picked berries, uh, strawberries and raspberries. Um, and that was a big industry for kids, and it was really, you know, it was a lot of fun, uh, you know, because you get to see kids from other schools, and uh, meet kids from other schools and it, <clears throat> I wasn't the fastest berry picker but you know I'd come out with maybe $35 for me in a season and you could buy your school clothes and uh, you know brand new shoes and blue jeans that are so stiff that you almost <laughs> had to put them in a vice to bend them <laughs> but you felt really good and you were contributing and taking care of yourself and uh, <clears throat> that's something that is you don't see too often anymore. And uh, <clears throat> I remember I had this thing they called the Fall Festival. And it start, It was in the September. And the Fall Festival was, well, they can't, you know, they ended up eliminating it because it was such a drunken festival. <laughs> I mean, it was, uh, but I looked forward to it because I would get up early Sunday morning with my wagon and I'd go up and pick up pop bottles and beer bottles. And one, one time I made 17 bucks in about six hours. You know what I mean, that's wow. half the wages of the paper out in a, you know, in a, in a month. And so, uh, and it was, it was really a neat parade they had with floats and you know, every band, marching bands from all the different schools. And, 
every community would enter their throats in the parade, and you know, it was a great community gathering, and which is you know kind of diminishing now. There isn't as much of a community. <coughs> uh, activities like uh, you see Elevation. now. It's been replaced with a summer festival now. Right, but, but you don't see very many marching bands and no. you don't see very many floats. I mean, Sumas would have a float, Linden would have a float, Everson would have a float. And I remember always watching them build floats when I was a kid. You know, you, they wouldn't let you in the shop, but you could have your head inside the door. And, and it, was, it, was, you know, it was such a community event. And it was a it was just a, a, a neat thing to, mm -hmm. to see and be part of. Tell them how you earned the money for your farm. Well, uh, well, there's a lot of ways I earned my money. Oh, I've only heard one story. <laughs> uh oh, careful, Benny. Let's hear the extra yeah. version. <laughs> Which one is it? Is it, is it, is it legal? <laughs> what are you yeah. doing in those greenhouses? Uh, <laughs> actually, I had people that came out and, and <clears throat> checked my greenhouses before. Uh, they were working undercover, but you could spot them a mile away. <laughs> is it the haircut? <laughs> well, just the way they were behaved on the farm. And they had no farm sense and uh, <clears throat> a lot of police sense. Uh, but um, my father and I, we had a, a, a bailing business. Uh, he'd find the customers and I'd do the bailing and I'd take care of the uh, uh, equipment. It was something I really liked to do and I was <clears throat> helping out the family. You know, we didn't have Mom was really pretty sick, and so <clears throat> what money we had went for medical bills or um, or just plain living. But so I don't know if I ever even got any, never even got paid for being. That it was such a fun thing to do, being a kid running a piece of equipment and driving it through town, and probably only being 15 at the time. And, uh, <clears throat> you mentioned also that when your mother got really sick that uh, the Presbyterian Church helped uh, a lot. Yeah, that, that was another. Uh, <clears throat> Mom was pretty sick when I was uh, kind of a little guy. and uh, I think but, you said it was 53 or 54, you think? Yeah, I was, was yeah, about 53. And, uh, and <clears throat> she, her condition went downhill, you know, on a monthly uh, scale, it's, you know, slide, and she never stopped getting sick. But the Presbyterian Church, especially the Presbyterian Church, was really, you know, so helpful, you know, they, uh, and the Lions Club, you know, they bought Mom a wheelchair and the church would find, uh, uh, bring meals in or, uh, you know, help in any way they could. and. And the entire community would, would do that. And you can still see it somewhat today, but it was just <clears throat> kind of standard procedure uh, back 50 years ago. Uh, it was that the church would pick up the slack you know, to help when help needed to be helped. And um, it's always, it's, it's impressed me with, with what a small community can have to offer as far as helping your neighbor. And it was certainly back then neighbors really helped neighbors. And they, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't live in the town anymore, so I don't really know if there's that much neighbor to neighbor helping neighbors to neighbors, but I'm presuming that there's still a tradition of doing that. Uh, I hope it's strong. Did your uh, steer event make the paper? Uh, <clears throat> no, the steer event. I don't. F we kind of kept that quiet, and yeah, I was, that sound like it with 15 trucks following. Well, <laughs> <laughs> getting the second steer home was was a real tough one, and I really don't want to go into 
that part of the uh, uh, how we actually got the steer home. You know, there might be some animal uh, rights folks here, and they think it was. Let me tell a story here. <laughs> I raised the house out in Linden uh, once, and the lady said that she remembers the farmhand running down the road chasing a cow. And uh, eventually he got the cow and, and got it home. Well, he had to go get a truck and bring it down and get it home. She said the, uh, a couple of days later she noticed the same cow went coming down the street and went across the berry patch across the road and ended up over by Depot Road down there where the school is. And uh, she noticed that the, uh, oh, the, the rendering truck came. The rendering truck came in there, and then she found out that the uh, the uh, farm owner had gone down and shot the cow down there at the other end of the field, and they butchered her out at the out down there. She wasn't going to she was not going to escape the third time. <laughs> Two strikes have beat. Another coffee story. I can tell my view of Chase Cows. Anybody that's Chase Cows understands that story very well. And the, the story, steer story, this fits in very well with that. Some cows are not uh, designed to be herded. <laughs> On my uh, paper route, going back to my paper route, you know, I was able to get a motorbike when I was about 14 uh, to deliver my papers. And I had a dog. It was a town's dog, but it was my dog. Uh, it, her name was Buffy, and it was a three-quarter three quarter, uh, border collie and one-quarter Malamute. And it would <coughs> wait for me until I got home. It would be working on the farm with Dad, but as soon as I saw the school bus go home, you know, he came by, and it was this time to help me deliver newspapers. And, uh, and it was fine with the bicycle, you know, and he... He knew exactly where to go, and and, and the, the interest. There was a couple of interesting things about this dog. But instead of taking the cat walk across the bridge, it always it always swam the river, and, uh, and it did it once when the river was flooding. And you know, I tried to stop her from getting in. You know, and it just. <laughs> And the last time I saw it, it was rounding the bend, you know, out of sight, and I thought. You know, it's, it's not good, but when I got down by the uh, Lions Club building, here she comes, you know, wet, and, but happy. But, but anyway, so when I went mechanized and gave up the bicycle to the motorbike, uh, the dog had a hard time keeping up. And so finally, what we did, what I did was, she was, learned how to ride on the back seat of my bike, Aww. and so uh, <clears throat> periodically, you know, and she wasn't really completely sold on the idea, <laughs> but you know, she was a good sport and she would do it, and, uh, but we just didn't do it on a daily basis, and, but uh, <clears throat> that was kind of a fun thing, just having a, a neat dog that would do stuff like that. And, they thought she couldn't herd cows. Well, it could herd. What? Well, the, but, but she was steer. out of the picture. Oh, she was she out was of the picture by the time I had steer. had steers. But yeah, she was a good <laughs> cow dog. Yeah, that's what you needed a good cow dog. Just an amazing dog. It was actually, it would like to go on hunting with people and it would retrieve pheasants. So um, mm -hmm. it would do a lot of different things. That, you learned how to hit the restaurants and get a free handout. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, Ben, on your uh, business right now, well, how many acres do you have? Can you tell just a little? I know you've told a snapshot of what you grow. Maybe just how large is it? Well, that's not very big. You know, I mean, we're real small. You know, I think. Uh, when when Gretchen and I were you know we've we've leased out most of it and uh, but when we, Gretchen and I were growing I think we were at 40 acres or so uh, but that was all retail produce and sold at different farmers markets and the neat thing to see although this isn't local history it's state history and 
Uh, when we started, there was only one farmer's market in... About what time? What year? That was in 1974. Uh, we took out the back seat of our Studebaker and I picked up a gallon of used engine oil from Bailey's to get me to Seattle. And we, 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 found, uh, we found the Pike Place Market and uh, we didn't have any containers, we didn't have any paper bags, but we had a lot of enthusiasm and uh, somebody helped us with selling us some containers where we could put the berries in. and. and <coughs> And this guy, the owner of service paper, came by, and uh, he knew we didn't have any paper bags, and so he bought a box of berries from us. And he said, "Well, I need a paper bag." <laughs> and uh, you know, it was probably my first or second sale of the day. I, <laughs> you know, I, I tried wrapping it in newspaper. I was desperate, but, but he said, "Hey, I, I'll, I'll sell you some paper bags." And, uh, but I didn't have any money. <laughs> we just made enough to get into town. But at the end of the day, we bought paper bags, and uh, and I knew that we had found a way of. of being successful in farming. And since then, uh, you know, we were original vendors in the university market in uh, West Seattle and Columbia City. And, uh, <coughs> you know, when we started, there was one market in the, maybe three markets in the whole country, one on the West Coast. And now, last time I heard, there's 125 or 30 markets in the state alone. And it's it's been a, a great, uh, great thing to see happen because it offers <coughs> independent people uh, an opportunity of making a living. And, uh, Do you go to all of those markets yourself? Uh, <coughs> well, <coughs> when we quit, we were doing 16 markets a week, wow. and so oh, uh, we uh, <coughs> we took the. The one, our favorite markets, I had a couple favorite markets, and Gretchen had a couple favorite markets, and, uh, and then our, <coughs> we would have other people manage the other ones. We'd put them on a percentage, and, and so, you know, a performance bonus that they should do with athletes. You know, instead of paying them guaranteed money, <coughs> pay them when they perform, and they don't get it when they don't perform. But, uh, uh, so, yeah, we didn't do all the markets, but I've been in all the markets. And how do you, how many people do you employ now, typically? Well, I only employ myself. Oh. <laughs> but uh, um, I think Gretchen uh, in the tulips, they probably have, I don't know, how many, six, seven, Gretchen? Well, in downtown, in Seattle, we have five, and then we have two, four here, so nine, ten. Ten in the tulips. What what's happened is that all the food part of our farm now is being managed by. Um, it started out with five people. It's down to one. Five said they would take over. We've been looking for years for somebody to be apprentice or manage the farm for us because we're getting older, and it was hard. But these five people said oh, we'll do it. Now it's down to one, like I say, and they pro and they go to oh, probably 25 market days. Uh, a year. And, we have, and they have a 1500 CSA uh, program. A CSA is a community supported agriculture where you can buy a membership and you get a box of food, uh, one box of food each week for 22 weeks. So uh, it's, it's really a, a pretty good program for the consumer and for the farmer. The farmer has some money up front and the consumer gets to eat things they would normally not always have a chance to you eat. You kind of know what to plant too, don't you? You are, yeah, yeah. You, that's key, you know, yeah. is, is knowing what to plant and when to plant it and uh, and how much to plant. Right. I mean, yeah. And what about, you know, the wreath business? If you could touch on that. Oh. That was oh, yeah, well, we, we made... Uh, evergreen race for years and years and years. Uh, it was actually, uh, you know, like everything else, it was an act of desperation at the time, because, you know, you had no money, and it was Christmas time, and I knew there was some way you could make some money out of this holiday season. And 
So <clears throat> the first reef we made, we did it on a coat hanger, and you know, I went to a florist trying to sell it, and trying to keep everything from sliding down to the bottom, <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> but the the florist sold me some uh, reef rings, and <clears throat> that kind of set us in business. I think first year we made 50 reefs, and we sold them at the Pike Market. And that was our place of business. Uh, but you know, eventually we got it up to a couple thousand, and we were uh, doing a lot of mail order, and uh, and then it was really good if uh, uh, people would walk through the market and before the terrorist attacks, you know, they could buy a reef and we'd put a handle on the box and they could take it on their plane and fly home. But uh, that <coughs> that's an add-on now or carry-on, so that has pretty much eliminated that business. But but we did that for about 25 years, I think, and it was a it was <clears throat> it was a real nice way of uh, not going broke. And having some money at Christmas time, it was intense like everything else we were doing, but you know, 3 weeks and you were done and hopefully you had some money for a vacation before the tulips would come on. And uh, it was a, yeah, it was your a fun tulips are off season then. Well, <coughs> they're not on the same time that Mount Vernon is. Well, they're 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 off season and on season. I mean, we do, you know, we we start selling them in December, and we're done when the last few tulip is picked out here. Ah. Um, so it's a spring, late winter and spring. Yeah, it's <coughs> mainly it's Valentine's. I mean, ah. we we really like Valentine's. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I mean, it's 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 a it's a good it's a great business. Uh, people are desperate for color this time of the year, especially on gray skies. And uh, tulips give people uh, some hope that mm -hmm. sunshine's going to come. Mm -hmm. And so it's been a and it's been a <clears throat> to, you know every every piece of food or item, in my opinion, has a job to do on this planet. You know, like tomatoes are good for uh, various, uh, and maybe your prostate, or berries are good for your prostate, or uh, garlic is good, good for your heart. Uh, <coughs> there's these little weeds in the, uh, that grow in your driveway, there's really medicinal. Uh, I mean, there's all kinds of plants that are good, and they have a specific job to do, and I am sure that Tulip's job is to make people happy, because, I mean, every time they come up to Tulip's, I mean, they can be the biggest grumps around, but by the time they leave, they're happy, and I'm happy because they left. <laughs> but also because you know we bought some tulips. But I mean, so you know, so, it's so you stagger your planting so that absolutely, yeah. We we have we move we move a set in. We call them sets, mm -hmm. and we move a set in every week. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to figure out how many you're going to sell each week the the year before. You know, like right now they're. Figuring out their schedule uh, for next year. Planning next uh, for, year. For, for planting next year. And how many tulips do you buy? <laughs> well, we're actually one of the smaller tulip growers. I mean, actually, there's only not very many tulip growers left. But we do a little over a half million. And uh, but again, it's there's no wholesale. It's all retail. Mm -hmm. And if you sell enough of them, you know, you can pay for the bulbs anyway, you hope. <laughs> you know, save your bulbs? No. So if we wanted to try any of these berries from your farm or, or buy any tulips, we can't just go by your farm. We have to find a Hyde Park market or where well, would we go to? No, I mean, we're, <coughs> we have never turned down a sale yet. <laughs> <laughs> Go, just go knocking on your door? Well, you, it, <laughs> it's hard well, to find them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you can call us and uh, uh, we can we can figure out, come up with a plan. Uh, no, but I mean, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> prime, you know, we've tried on the farm sales and uh, we're just far enough away from the traffic that uh, 
it's always, I think next year we'll be able to break even, you know, <laughs> and so, and it's just, it just isn't worth it, uh, but we are more than happy for people to call us and say we would like to buy some da-da-da and, uh, and we can set up a time and take care of that. Didn't you grow peonies too for a while? Oh yeah, I still have them. Okay. Uh, uh, <coughs> and I had a whole, well, we won't go into, yeah, you know, I have, yeah, there's, they're really a nice flower and it's a great follow-up from tulips because you already have your customer base and, is, <coughs> and they smell good and they have a decent shelf life and they're, it's a one-time planting and uh, they mm -hmm. should produce for years and years and years and years. Uh, but again, it's like anything else, you know, it's easy to grow but tough to sell. And that's the tricky part is selling it and making a profit. But we've been getting lucky for a while. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Well, I was just going to say, one of my happiest days was buying tulips at the farm. I wanted, I wanted like four or five bundles of tulips for like thank you presents and stuff. So I, I called Gretchen and I went up to the farm and just walking in the greenhouse with all those tulips and all those colors was mind-boggling. And she'd say, well, tell me what you like, we'll make some bundles. And so I, I, I figured out two, and then I was too overwhelmed. I just couldn't make any more decisions. So Gretchen just finished the job for me, and I went out the door with incredible, fresh, fresh tulips. It was, and they lasted a long time because they were so fresh. It was thrilling. So yeah, call the farm. <laughs> It's great. Yeah, somebody asked if I, if we save the bulbs or not, and the the answer is is no, we don't. Um, and, and the reason why is you start the way to have a quality product is you start with a quality seed or a quality bulb, and uh, there is nobody anywhere that can outgrow a Dutchman in Holland on growing a good bulb. I mean, it's just, you just can't do it. Uh, I have a friend up in Canada. I mean, you know, you can grow some own bulbs, but, and I had thought about doing it, but you're looking at probably a half million bucks in infrastructure just to be able to grow your bulbs. So, uh, and then you can't grow all of the ones you want anyway. And <clears throat> you, in my experience, is going to tell me that it's going to take a few years to get it down to where you aren't putting out a, less than a good bulb and there's nothing worse than <coughs> going through a, the whole crop and growing it, planting it and taking care of it and having to throw it out because it can't reach the quality that uh, you have to have to sell in the marketplace and um, <coughs> we have a good good broker in the Netherlands and uh, so it works out best that way. Uh, um, it would be nice to be able to grow your own, but um, I'm not going to. <laughs> you try selling the bulbs? Oh, well, I just don't really want to. I, I'll give them to you. You can come up and take as many as you want. <laughs> and I mean, and you can get some flowers out of them. Yeah. Uh, and then what I've noticed uh, is that on hyacinths, we grow some hyacinths, and we always cut the bulb off the stem um, for packaging and for selling. And and I used to throw some of the bulbs, you know, the broken pieces of bulbs out, and they will rejuvenate and and um, really do quite well. And I that's probably one of the things if I could redo, I would be replanting all my garbage parts of the hyacinths and uh, rejuvenating them. And, but, you know, I, I have it, and it's easy to say you should do it, and it's more difficult to do it. It just takes coordination, and I don't, I'd rather spend my time playing right now than anything. Easier said than done. Yes. Easier said than done. Yes. 
Yes. So, with your past history, do you uh, raise any cattle at this time? <laughs> uh, I raise a dog and three cats, and sometimes uh, I'm a, Gretchen and I will raise some uh, mighty meat ch uh, chickens, you know, to eat. But uh, no beef. No beef. <laughs> no, no pigs either. I've had pigs too, and I've chased them, and they're, <laughs> they're not only quick and fast, but they're really smart. Destructive. Oh. Rototiller on four legs. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So how did you and Gretchen meet? Um, well, <laughs> um, we met, there were some... Uh, young ladies that were living down uh, on Alm Road, uh, a, you know, a half a mile away or a quarter of a mile away that uh, I was propagating friendships with. And, uh, and I, w I, was, I was living, you know, I was, at that time I was still living my dream on the farm, you know, going to be self-sufficient and uh, living in the woods. And uh, so, <clears throat> As I stopped to visit these young ladies, Gretchen was there, and uh, and I was on actually I was on my way to the laundromat, uh, with my, but you know I was just checking in to see what was going on. Uh, I didn't want to miss a thing, you know, and, and so Gretchen said, "Oh, well, I have some laundry to do too, and so can I come with you?" Oh, yeah, sure. And so that's how we met. We kind of met in the laundromat, <coughs> and, and, and the rest is pretty much history. Yeah. What year was that? That was in '74. No, that was a big year for you. What? '73. '71. Oh, '71. <laughs> '72. '72. '72. It was '72. Yeah. I didn't mean to get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah, I was supposed to remember things like that. <laughs> That seems odd, because I was buying my property now in 72. Um, I had been down here visiting my daughter, so that was my first uh, experience with this whole area. And I really fell in love with it. So when did you move up on all Hill? 80, 84. I, I moved up there, um, I got out of the Army in 71, uh, 72. 72. Yeah, oh. Same year you met Gretchen, huh? Um, you didn't live sim it. a single life very long up there. Well, yeah, let's see, I got out seven. Yeah, <laughs> I guess, yeah, I was there for one winter. And the first winter, you know, I moved in there. Uh, I, mean, I had plastic windows and kind of a blanket covering the door that didn't quite close all the way. And I remember I was had my bed right next to the stove and it was really cold out, you know, and my floor was kind of rough, rustic, you know, with knot holes and air vents and stuff. <laughs> anyway, I woke up about, you know, sometime in the middle of the night to stoke the fire, you know, I was just cold and my hand hit the can of water by the stove and it turned to ice. <laughs> and so right then I decided, you know, I'm going to save my firewood until I can get some heat out of it in a, in a warmer night. But, uh, boy, and it, that was the thing, another thing that's impressed me is how much milder our winters have gotten. Uh, even though you think, you know, this was a bad winter, I can remember being kids uh, going out on the river in the winter time when it was, if it wasn't frozen all the way over, it was nearly frozen over, you know, with a stream of water maybe two or three feet wide. Mm -hmm. And I can remember we, <coughs> if we would, well, sometimes we'd take, just take the day off in school. But, uh, <laughs> and we'd go take our sleds and we'd take a run and jump on the sled and you would slide, you know, hundreds of feet and it was, and you always hoped that when it would freeze, the wind wasn't blowing, so it would be nice and flat instead of those, those bumpy things. And, uh, and usually we could find a place that it was flat, and we could just, you know, sled all day long. But I can remember one time when 
you know, I found some ice that wasn't quite as thick as it should have been. <laughs> and, you know, I, I went in and, and I got out and <clears throat> literally as I was walking up to the bridge, the highway to go home, you know, you could hear the ice cracking on my clothes. I mean, it was just instantly frozen. And uh, I was pretty impressed at how cold it was and how tough I was to make, <laughs> make frozen clothing. But, uh, my, my parents were not as impressed as I was that day. Well, they weren't positively impressed anyway. <laughs> yes. But, uh, well, they really knew you. They they knew me. <laughs> they were just thankful you were alive. Yeah, well, you know, it wasn't anything life threatening. It was, you know, it was shallow water. You know, I don't think it only went up to my waist. But uh, you can die in sh shallow water. <laughs> yeah, well, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I think we got a wrap on it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Ben.